Today is all about a G.I. Joe whose legacy has had more impact on G.I. Joe lore than the footprint that the man himself had in comics, animation, and even toys. Yes, you guessed it. Today is all about General Flagg. Born September 10, 1932 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, General Lawrence J. Flagg comes from a long line of military ancestors. Following with Flagg family tradition, he attended VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, and joined the United States Army, working his way up to Brigadier General. He served in Korea and Vietnam, earning a Bronze Star, a Silver Star, and a Purple Heart. At one point, Flagg was tasked with standing up counter-terrorist group Delta, a rapid deployment force capable of taking on global terrorism and the insidious Cobra organization, along with an increasingly complicated global threat matrix. This new group, inspired by Joe Colton's old exploits before the Adventure Team days, with the ultimate freedom fighting force, also took on the codename of G.I. Joe. He built this new team with collaboration from General Austin and a guy named Sparks. Larry Hama's G.I. Joe Declassified miniseries details the earliest days of this new team and their exploits in pre-Marvel's Real American Hero series. We learn there that Flagg recruited Colonel Clayton Abernathy, codenamed Hawk, shortly after Hawk came out of a closed-door court-martial session. Sparks convinced Flagg to recruit Steeler. Flagg pulled Flash from a covert electronics shop at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Clutch was General Austin's personal driver and had transported Hawk after he was acquitted. It turns out that a rogue general had paid a mercenary named Major Blood to send in some hitmen to take out Hawk, but it failed, and as a result, Cobra Commander charged Blood with putting a bullet in Flag at his next opportunity. Then with Hawk, the full bird in place, the rest of the team fell in line. When the G.I. Joe team was officially activated, Hawk was running the team in the field for Flag, even as they were already spread out. For example, Steeler and Flash were at the Fort Wadsworth Motor Pool, where Grand Slam was monitoring comms while Snake Eyes and Scarlet were out on the water around New York City, and Hawk, Breaker, and Clutch were meeting with S.A. Provost, who would later become Chuckles, in Battery Park in New York City. At this exact same time, General Flagg was operating out of a top-secret sub-basement utility closet at the Pentagon. This is the black site where he ran ops out of in those early days, including a mission to Sierra Gordo that involved his newest operatives like Zap, Stalker, Rock and Roll, and Grunt. General Austin was running interference between this new team and a secret cabal of generals known as the Jugglers right there at the Pentagon. As a failsafe for this mission, a backstop if you will, both Flag and Sparks from the Pentagon sent in sniper Jody Shooter Craig to cover the team in Sierra Gordo even without them knowing. As Cobra Commander in the Baroness kidnapped Dr. Adele Burkhart, Generals Austin and Flagg sent in the Joes to recover her. At first, though, Flagg suggested they attempt rescue, fail, and have Cobra Commander kill Dr. Burkhart, mainly because she had a bunch of national security secrets in her head that they couldn't fall into the wrong hands and have the U.S. government embarrassed. But it ended up being that the only option was to rescue her, and that's how the Joes were activated on their first mission in G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, Issue 1, and so they had Clutch Drive Hawk to the Joes Command Center to prep. After this mission, where Shooter lost her life, which was dubbed Operation Lady Doomsday, General Flagg and Sparks visited Shooter's mother at a church and then attended the memorial service for her with the entire G.I. Joe team, though the team still didn't know who Shooter was. After an Arctic research station was attacked near the North Pole, Generals Austin and Flagg pulled Snake Eyes, Scarlet Stalker, and Breaker off leave for that mission. Flag actually flew to the AO with the team and was forwarding them intel as it came in, including details on the Russians and the mercenary Quinn. In issue 5, General Flag had Steeler bring the Mobat to an Armed Forces Day parade to see if the Joint Chiefs could pick it out of the line of other military hardware at the parade. Flag sat in a special viewing stand along with the other generals right there on 5th Avenue in New York City. Cobra ended up ambushing them and it ended up with the Mobat crashing into the general's seating to expose Cobra Commander's setup which was directly beneath the viewing stand they were on. Flag chased Cobra Commander, but the safety was still on his weapon when Cobra Commander shot General Flag in the head. But he was just fine, he said that the bullet just grazed his temple. They asked him why he left the safety gun and he said this is what separated them from the bad guys. Back at the pit, Scarlet bandaged Flag up while Breaker showed Flag their chewing gum trick that made it sound like the tank fired its main gun right in New York City. In issue 11 for the pipeline ploy mission in Alaska, General Flag had to deny quarantine and reinforcements to Breaker, citing personnel already being spread thin. In the next issue, Flag had Hawk at his Pentagon command center planning their next op, insert a small recon team in South America to track MX missile guidance chips that were stolen out west. In issue 16, Flag was now at the Joe's headquarters, as Hawk told him how Cobra planned to poison American currency at the Bureau of Printing and Engraving in Washington, D.C. 
Hawk wanted to put up a special cordon of Joes around the Bureau, but Flag denied him at first, saying that Cobra was already planning to hit the Capitol building. Instead of G.I. Joe, Flag had the entire Virginia National Guard deploy. Flag was right there with his troops in the streets, arguing with Hawk when it appeared that Cobra was attacking the Capitol building. General Flag was sans hat in Operation Disappearance while he was talking with his team. 1984's A Real American Hero Issue 19 was a turning point for G.I. Joe. The G.I. Joe team had some Cobra captured like the Baroness, Major Blood, and Scarface, and so Cobra attacked the base to recover their agents. Flag even had Doc and CoverGirl take the wrapped-up Baroness to the prefab fortress at the surface just before the attack commenced. Hawk and Flag knew Cobra were going to retaliate, and so they let them, setting a trap at first, letting them think that the above-ground facilities were all there was. Cobra did in fact attack, with Snake Eyes and Quinn trapped in Dr. Venom's snake armor for their assault. Inside the prefab fortress, Major Blood managed to take out Doc, and he was trying to escape when General Flag pulled his sidearm to stop him. Scarface kicked the gun out of Flag's hand, Major Blood caught the gun, and shot the general dead. Doc carried Flag out of the fortress, trying to save him and treat him just before the fortress exploded, and outside amongst the rubble, Doc was upset, crying out that he couldn't save Flag. Flag died on March 19th in the 19th issue. In issue 21, Destro had a chess set which had General Flag as one of the pieces. In issue 22, the entire G.I. Joe team went to Arlington National Cemetery for General Flag's burial. And then in issue 36, the Joe's flagship vessel, the freighter USS Jane, was destroyed, and so they got a replacement, a newly christened Essex-class aircraft carrier named CV-99, the USS Flag, loosely modeled after USS Intrepid CVA-11. In the letters page in issue 253, Larry Hama mentions General Flag when he lists out everyone who died, though he did pass in issue 19 and not 16. Whoops. In issue 263, Duke and Roadblock visited Arlington National Cemetery to pay their respects to the General. And then in the final issue of the run, General Flag appeared on the cover of the main book along with everybody else, and there he is right there holding the line near Quinn in between the October Guard and the Red Shadows. After the general died, the mantle effectively passed down to his son, James L. Flagg III, who was born in Alexandria, Virginia. This flag also went to Virginia Military Institute, like the five previous generations of the Flagg family. He also served bravely, earning a Medal of Valor twice and countless decorations before taking over command of the G.I. Joe team. This general flag served as both general commander and chief strategic officer for G.I. Joe. This flag also did appear in a comic book, albeit a non-traditional sized comic book, and that was Mountain Trouble, a Battlecore mini-comic that came out in 1993 with some of the action figures. Flag also appeared briefly in a flashback in G.I. Joe America's Elite, issue 35. This was the series run by Devil's New Publishing. He did appear on the roster-wide cover of issue 25, and then another time in G.I. Joe vs. Transformers where he, in this continuity, started G.I. Joe in response to the Transformers arriving on Earth. There was also a major flag over on the Battle Action Force side, though that was Francis Monroe Dayton, and he served as the commanding officer of Action Force early on. When Marvel took over, their commanding officer became a guy named Trent. A year after G.I. Joe's first flag was KIA, and to align with its debut in comics, the USS Flag was released as a massive playset. Designed by Hasbro vehicle designer Greg Bernson, the USS Intrepid-inspired USS Flag is one of the biggest playsets ever built. So big that Hasbro thought it a joke at first, referring to it as it went through those early iterations as the coffee table. It's about seven and a half feet long of pure awesomeness for a mere 109 US dollars. Well, that's 301.58 in today's dollars, but more like four figures on the collector market. The flag boasts an operable lift, a working arrestor hook, a functioning jet blast deflector, and a usable PA system that can toggle between PA, air raid, general quarters, and all clear. You also get the fuel trailer and the, the rig to tow it. You even have the Admiral's boat launch and a rotating missile defense system along with a phased array ray dome and the 76 Mike Mike anti-ship guns. This playset is ready to dominate any battlefield and any living room. Greg and the designers at Hasbro traveled to Naval Air Station Quonset Point in Rhode Island for research. Quonset Point on Narragansett Bay has a deep water port which made it a logical home port for much of the Essex-class fleet in the U.S. Navy's arsenal like the USS Wasp, USS Tarawa, and of course the USS Intrepid. Intrepid served bravely in World War II where she battled Super Battleship Yamato in the Pacific Theater and survived multiple kamikaze attacks. She later served during the Vietnam War and in 1969 became the flagship vessel for Carrier Division 16. 
If you take the 16 out of the 1969 date to represent CD16, you're left with the numbers 99, the whole number of the USS flag. Bernson, though, says he chose 99 because he knew it would be some time before U.S. Navy vessels would go that high in numbering. During the Cold War, the Fighting Eye helped recover a capsule for Project Mercury. USS Flagg was able to catch the USS Defiant, a G.I. Joe space shuttle modeled after Lockheed Martin's X-33 Venture Star. That occurred during one particular special mission. In 1974, Intrepid was decommissioned, and in 1982, Congress voted to designate Intrepid a museum. In 85, the year the G.I. Joe version was released, Intrepid was nominated as a National Historic Landmark. Admiral Keelhaul commands the USS Flag, and it was Keelhaul who flew F-4s off the Intrepid in the 1960s. And then it was Admiral Ledger, not Keelhaul in the animated series, who commands what would be the Flag Carrier Strike Group. Let's talk about General Flag himself. He looks like he borrowed General Patton's B-3 sheepskin jacket and General MacArthur's crush cap. Throw in some Henry Fonda and William Holden and you have Flag. His comic book appearance, and Declassified especially, also looks a bit like James Montgomery Flagg, an artist and cartoonist who was arguably most famous for his poster of Uncle Sam for the U.S. Army World War I recruitment effort. This flag maybe was one of the preceding generations of the Flagg family. At Fort Knox in Kentucky, there's also Flagg Field, which is dedicated to James M. Flagg. It's apropos that G.I. Joe's General Flag recruited much of the original team. As an 07 BG, he's senior enough to plant his own flag, meaning he's General Officer and Flag Officer. In other words, General Flag. General Flag had an action figure in 1992, long after he died in the comics, and so these are actually Flag's son. He had a Battle Corps figure in 93 and a third in 2004, which is a three-pack along with a Cobra Officer and Steeler. For this release, Flagg's file name was James Longstreet Flagg the Third. No Lawrence, which is weird because he's named the Third. Other file cards just have his middle initial. The 2017 General Flagg was part of the G.I. Joe Collectors Club figure subscription service. Voiced by John Stevenson, General Flagg appeared in the Sunbow G.I. Joe A Real American Hero animated series, though only in the Mass Device miniseries. Here, Flagg is depicted more as looking like how General Austin looked in the comics, or Navy Rear Admiral Wilson Flagg, who earned multiple medals like the Distinguished Service Medal, but then unfortunately became entangled in the tailhook scandal in 1991 while the G.I. Joe Flagg Jr. action figure was still in pre-production. Sadly, Admiral Flagg was on board American Airlines Flight 77 when it hit the Pentagon on September 11, 2001, and he lost his life. Right after 9-11, the USS Intrepid became a temporary FBI emergency operations center. And I'll leave you with an Amelia Earhart quote that General Flagg recited at Shooter's Memorial Service amidst the pouring rain as the cloth of an American flag waved and snapped in the storm. Courage is the price that life extracts for granting peace. The soul that knows it not knows no release from little things, knows not the livid loneliness of fear, nor the mountain heights where bitter joy can hear the sound of wings. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.